At ten past six tonight on BBC One, one of the most popular films ever made, The Sound of Music. Winner of five Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Direction, it stars Julie Andrews as the convent girl who is sent to be governess to seven motherless children and features songs such as Climb Every Mountain, Do Re Mi, Maria and Edelweiss. Christopher Plummer is the co-star of The Sound of Music at ten past six tonight. This is BBC One. Very warm welcome to Nationwide's Royal Celebration. Now, have you ever seen anything quite like those crowds in the Mall this afternoon? Absolutely amazing. Old people, young people, all having the times of their life. Well, they've been cheering and we've been cheering and also drinking a toast to the Prince and Princess of Wales. In fact, having a very informal party and a celebration here to wish uh, health, long life and happiness to the royal couple. Of course, around the world, hundreds of millions of people were watching the ceremony on their television sets, but we have here with us some of the people who were lucky enough to be inside St Paul's itself this morning. People like Kiri Takanawa, who sang that beautiful aria, and uh, then there are the boys of St Paul's choir, and then other guests like Michael Benteen, who were special guests of the royal family. And uh, let me tell you this, don't worry that you're missing anything by being at our party, because while all this is going on, we are in constant touch with Buckingham Palace, and as soon as we know that the Prince and Princess of Wales are ready to set off on their honeymoon, we'll be rejoining Tom Fleming for a grandstand view, if I may say so, on the way to Waterloo Station. Now, in the meantime, as well as mingling with our guests here and having a very happy party indeed, we've got all sorts of people. Alan Price is here, Dame Janet Baker with that gorgeous voice, and dear Joe Loss is over here, a favourite at many a royal party and a great uh, favourite with everybody to provide entertainment throughout the afternoon. Anyway, what better way to start than with a stirring march from the band of the Welsh Guards. It was specially composed by their director of music, Major Derek Taylor, in honour of uh, Diana, Princess of Wales, their Colonel-in-Chief's new bride.
the band of the Welsh Guards, and they'll be back at the party later to accompany Dame Janet Baker. Now, before you joined us, we were all talking here about the ceremony, and I think you would probably agree with us that one of the things that made the service such a moving occasion was the music. And with me and Richard are some of the people whose talents we've all just been enjoying, among them Kiri Tikanoa, who sang that beautiful aria by Handel. Kiri, what was going through your mind in the minutes before you had to stand up and sing before all those people? Well, the timing, basically. I was watching, because it was minute by minute show and on in the uh, order of service, how things would go. And I knew exactly when I was to sing, and it was going so perfectly to time that I was eating sweeties. I have some special cough things. And I took a thermos of, frozen, of cold water and uh, soda water and lemon bits, and I was drinking it and glugging away through the service, which is a bit rude. But I had to do it, because I'm quite used to drinking and, and eating sweeties. And it was up to the last minute I sort of swallowed the, the sweet just before the, the introduction started to let the right Sarah. Well, now, especially for you, and also as a treat for us, who would love to hear it again. You've we're, got it? Yes, we've got oh, it. And we're going to, love to, see we're going to hear <laughs> just part of it anyway. Thank you very much. was a magnificent sound, Kiri. They, about the hat. They, they call you the divine <laughs> songbird, and for a reason. Yes, I'm going to ask you about Isn't that hat. Cutie. Well, look, this is a lovely man who is called Philip Somerville, yes. and he designed it because he saw the dress, and I said, I don't want anything that moves. If it moves, it's going to kill me. And I didn't want, I didn't want it to shake. I didn't want feathers or anything. It had to be very small mm -hmm. and not be sort of these big floaty things. So he did this, and we tried everything. My husband chose the shape, and uh, I thought I thought it went quite well, actually. Really super. <laughs> well, also with us is William Mathias, who wrote the special anthem that was sung during the service. Um, now, how did things go for you, Professor? Were, everything according to plan? Everything absolutely according to plan. Even better than one had imagined, I think. Well, now, of course, you were sitting there mm. in the cathedral yes, during the service. Right. We are now going to give you the opportunity to hear it again, only the way we all heard it, watching here. And, and you may, in fact, uh, notice some differences, because obviously the acoustic will be totally different. Fine. Let's hear part of it. Was it a, a very difficult work to perform for the choir? Um, well, I wouldn't have thought it was terribly difficult because they're all so good. I mean, every member of the choir is a professional. All, all the choir boys, and when you have people like Barry Rose and Christopher Dernley and Richard Popplewell and so on, you can't go wrong. Briefly, what did you think of the music as a whole? Well, I think it was a very important occasion, quite yes. apart from being an important wedding, because when one heard it, one was tremendously aware all the time of how much music there was going on. It was very much part of the ceremony as a whole. And I think, quite apart from the people one had seen, I think one has to bear in mind uh, that the person who had been helping <coughs> the Prince of Wales to direct it overall was yeah. Sir David Wilcox, who I think did a marvellous job on the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and also the fact that, in fact, the Prince of Wales had taken an interest in every minute detail of the programme. I think it's very important for our musical future. A magnificent musical occasion. Thank yeah. you both very much indeed. Thank you. Well, Barry Rose, the music was a triumph and your choir was a marvellous success for you. Nothing seemed to go wrong. Was this as exciting for you as it seemed to us? Oh, yeah. Very much so. Yes, we were very excited about the whole occasion. Obviously, the build-up uh, we were more worried about. You had an incident, somebody told me, with a lampshade. Well, Tell us what happened. 
<laughs> now look, before one of the choristers tells you, uh, I actually, in the Mathias piece, I let my left hand go and I knocked the lampshade off and did a wonderful double somersault. Uh, did, did the uh, happy couple notice? Uh, I'm afraid they did. Yes, one of the boys said that they nudged they... each other and had a quick smile. <laughs> <laughs> but this has justified all those long, long hours of preparation and rehearsal, has it? Oh yes, yes, yes. We put a lot of work into this. Is St Paul's a different place in which to sing when it's packed like this. You've got so many people there and, and packed with carpets and thousands of people. Is it different? Well, yes, very different. We sing in about nine services a week and we use this wonderful acoustic. And then suddenly we get in there this morning, the heat, the lights um, and all, all, all the people have just mopped up that reverberation. And the congregation, it, sound, it sounded to me as if they behaved pretty well. They kept in time with the, uh, with the hymns. Well, yes, that's a triumph for Christopher who played <laughs> them over at the tempo and said, right, in we go. <laughs> Piers, this must have been exciting for you. Will you remember it all your life? Yes, yes, I will. What will you particularly remember? What's your strongest memory out of it? Well, I think it's when the couple went through the choir up to the altar to sign the register. She looked marvellous, didn't yes. she? Yes. Jeremy, were you nervous or are you as a chorister used to big occasions? Well, I think we, we're all used to them now. I wasn't really nervous. Not. Did you sleep well last night? Well, I uh, got about seven and a half hours, but uh, the noise down Ludgate Hill kept most of us awake. But all that practice, it's all been worthwhile? Yes, definitely. And Tim, finally, what was your favourite piece of music today that you sang? Oh, well, as Dr Mathias is here, I ought to say I enjoyed his piece most, oh. but... <laughs> <laughs> I rather like... Uh, I think my favourite piece was the hymn, I Vowed to Leave My Country. Well, I, I, I love that too, and congratulations to all of you. Thank you. But I tell you what, now we move from the sublime to the ridiculous, because with me are a handful of very unlikely candidates for St Paul's choir stalls, but uh, who in the course of their careers have provided hours of entertainment at the invitation of the royal family. We've got Dickie Henderson, Paul Daniels and dear Joe Loss. Dickie, what an, what an audience in the mall this afternoon. I mean, have you ever seen crowds like that? I mean, can you imagine playing to an audience like that? I haven't seen crowds like that, Frank, since First House Friday night at the Finsbury Park Empire <laughs> in 1938. It was the most magical morning I've spent. We started off very early, having a breakfast at home, a few friends, and we started with Bucksfish just to get it going, and then we watched the whole thing, and at the end, one of us went out, and we had to guess which one had gone out of the room. <laughs> now listen, listen, I'm obviously not going to persuade you to be serious, nor would I no, wish to, would. nor would I wish to. But listen, they're having their great royal breakfast at the moment, their yeah. wedding breakfast, and they're all there, and you've been in, you, you've entertained them in that situation. What is the atmosphere like when they're all together like that? Well, um, I get a little bit serious now, because I think our royal family, if you went to casting and cast them by a casting agency for a film, people would say, it's not true. Perfect, too perfect. Because they are so perfect, so gracious, so charming, and the only time I've met them is through charitable work, and they do so much for everybody. Well, Paul Daniels here, actually, you've got a head start because you're playing at the Prince of Wales. I mean, that must have given you a line or two, no doubt. Yeah, well, I claim I've had a longer engagement with the Prince of Wales than she had, and I'm upset that he married her, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and we're celebrating it a little bit tonight by giving everyone a, a special commemorative programme cover in silver, which just houses the standard program. Yeah. And this little guy on the back is hand out the front of the theatre and he's just wishing them the best luck. He's the, the rabbit we have. Now tell me, when you're performing uh, you know, for royalties, as you all do on, on private occasions, aren't you afraid of going a bit too far? I mean, you can't really take the mickey, because you're a great mickey-taking comic or magician, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. I mean, have you ever gone just that little bit too far? Yes, yes, which is why I haven't received my knighthood yet. <laughs> and I'm very unlikely to. <laughs> but um, with, with magic, it's, you just judge it as you judge every performance and you go in a bit if you, if you like. There's even a trick out now being dedicated to them and it just so happens I have it with me and uh, in which you, you, I know Prince Philip is not the king yeah. but, but there is a king in a pack of cards you see and the king said to the queen look about our son whose name is Charles he says, he says well we keep pictures of him absolutely everywhere you see now, yes. having got that, he said, now, wouldn't it be nice if he found a girlfriend? So he did, and her name was Diana, and he kept pictures of her absolutely everywhere. <laughs> and the king said, He's such a, she's such a nice-looking girl. He said, why don't you marry her? So today they did, and we all hope, I'm sure, that they live happily together absolutely you are ever incredible. afterwards. You are <laughs> incredible. <laughs> now we have dear Joe Lost. Joe, it's great to see you. You're, you're slim and you're as young looking as I remember you 25 years ago. And we, you have lots of fans out here who have danced to you all over the years. And the royals have danced to you and you've, you've been at parties forever. And when did you do your first royal engagement? When you were born, Frank. I think about 20 years ago. And where was that and for whom? Uh, at Buckingham Palace. I 
Well, it was a private party given by Her Majesty, and after that, I was uh, very honoured uh, to be invited to play at the different weddings, members of the family, and occasions. And uh, further to what Dickie was saying about our royals, I remember being aboard the QE2 and I was flown back to play for the Queen's 50th birthday party. And as we have a lot of American uh, passengers on the QE2 at the time, so they said, isn't it marvellous you're going back to play for your royal family? I said, well, what about America? Is it just exciting? They said, yes, we do have a president, but you have a queen. <laughs> so, I mean, that is really summing it all up to the eyes of the world. Tell me, uh, let me ask Dickie, why is it this guy has survived so long? I mean, he, he's, he's an absolutely <laughs> perennial, isn't he? He Younger goes on and on and on. Why, why is it? <laughs> good is it easy? <laughs> a, a has a good doctor. V has a wonderful wife, Mildred. And C, he is a complete <laughs> professional. And professionals outlast trends. Well, look, that's a terrific <laughs> cue for you, Joe. The boys Thank are waiting over much. here in our studio. Thank Will you take up your baton and uh, proceed in front of them? They're looking very smart. They've got their best jackets on. Of course, we could hardly invite Joe Lost to our party without asking him to play for us. So uh, let's enjoy a number which he's not only played at many royal parties, but which has delighted his fans for many, many years. It is, of course, the Joe Lost signature tune. Joe, in the mood.
I think, actually, if you're not in the royal wedding mood by now, I can safely assure you, you never will be. But uh, seriously, if you are champing at the bit to get back to the palace, wanting to see the royal couple again, we will be going back. We're keeping a weather eye on the palace, so as soon as they come out to leave for Waterloo, we'll be going back. In the meantime, let's meet some more of our guests, because today is bound to go down as the social event of the decade. And the guest list was really like a worldwide who's who, really. There were kings and queens, emperors and empresses, princes and princesses, presidents and prime ministers. And sitting proudly in the middle of them all were Flo and Bernard and Rocky and Anne. Well, Flo, first of all, tell me, you were Prince Charles's bedder at Cambridge. Now, I think you've become quite famous, actually, over the past couple of days. But for the sake of people who don't know what Charles's bedder was, perhaps you'd better tell us. <laughs> Well, um, a bed maker who makes the um, beds and washes up and cleans for any student. So you looked after him yes, when, looked when he was there? Yes. Right. And let me just um, ask Rocky as well. Rocky, can you explain to us why you had an invitation to the wedding today? What are your royal connections? Well, I, I, I believe that um, uh, Prince Charles uh, took over from Lord Louis as uh, president. Of your of your HMS Kelly, Kelly Association. Kelly Association. Yeah. That's um, right. There are not many survivors left of the ship now. Anyway, 36 actually. And uh, uh, after we lost the captain, uh, uh, Prince Charles says, "Can I take over the anchor?" So you're you're representing a tremendous number of people actually. Not a tremendous course, number, no. Uh, just a few. Let me ask your wife Anne. What was your favourite moment during the whole ceremony? I think when I saw Diana walk down the aisle and also the little bridesmaids. The they looked so, so lovely. lovely didn't oh, it was they? really lovely. That huge train. You know, yes, train yes, 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 yes. And she looked beautiful. Bernard, you've met a few famous and royal people in the past. I wouldn't few say days. that. I wouldn't say that. You have no. in the past well, couple of days. I gather yeah. you went to the ball as well, you oh, two. Of course, yes. Well, who most impressed you then? I think mainly a Princess Alexander. Why? Well, I'll, we had the honour of. Uh, she sat down at our table, and I thought that was extremely nice. So, Flo, a wonderful, wonderful time that you thought you would never have in all your yes. life. You've had a wonderful lovely. week. Yes. Tremendous. Lovely. Absolutely. Well, nice. thank you all very much, yes. anyway, and um, carry on drinking. Thanks very much. Let's complete a lovely day for you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as we said when you joined us at the party, we're in constant touch with Buckingham Palace and we can tell you that the wedding breakfast is still underway, but don't worry because the moment we have any news of their departure for Waterloo Station, we'll rejoin Tom Fleming and the crowds in the Mall. Now, ever since the engagement was announced, thousands of you have taken the trouble to send us your own tributes and memories. Many of these came in the form of specially written songs. Now, sadly, of course, we can't play all of them, but we thought you'd like to hear one of the best. And it was written by 13-year-old Jenny Jay from Dulwich in London. Well, Jenny, before we hear your song, um, what, uh, what did you think of the wedding? I thought it was lovely. I really enjoyed it. What in particular stuck in your mind? The wedding dress. What do you think of that? I thought it was gorgeous. It was really, you know, I could tell that it been, took a lot of thought into it. Was there any other incident that you'll particularly remember from today? When, um, Lady Diana and Prince Charles were walking up out of St Paul's and also when she made the mistakes about the names. You mean when she said uh, Philip Charles, Arthur so, George, yes. instead of Charles Philip? The sort of mistake I think one's allowed on a wedding day mm -hmm. and you'll discover. You get rather nervous on those <laughs> days. I think you'll find later. Well, Jenny, thank you very much. Thank you. With Jenny are three of her school friends, Tammy Laherty, Lisa Hopton and Nicola Strong. So here with her own very special tribute to the royal couple is Jenny Jay and a new dance called Chaz Die. Up and down 
Jenny Jay and three of her friends and uh, their tribute to Charles and Diana are and we're going back over to Buckingham Palace now. And we're looking back now at Buckingham Palace because we believe that the royal couple are going to leave on their journey to Waterloo. They're traveling in another of those beautiful coaches over to Waterloo where they will take the train to begin their honeymoon. We can't quite see if they're inside there. It's just going in to collect them, we believe. Obviously, the wedding breakfast has come to an end. Lady Diana will have changed, or the Princess of Wales, of course, as we now must call her will have changed and will be getting into that coach to make her way to Waterloo with her new husband. Well, we'll be going back there, of course, as soon as she's got into that coach and uh, going all the way with them to Waterloo. But in the meantime, back at the party, let's meet now uh, one third of a famous group of gentlemen. You've probably already spotted him sitting beside me. He's probably had more of an influence on the Prince's sense of humour than any others. He's, of course, Michael Benteen. Michael, you've known the Prince for a long time, haven't you? Uh, no. Well, yes, yes, of course, in a way. Um, I was at a party at the, the Belfry many years ago with, uh, as he then, the, the new Duke of Edinburgh, brand new Duke of Edinburgh, uh, because we were all members of a little thing called the Thursday Club to wet Prince Charles's head. Really? <laughs> yes, yes. So you've known members anything. of the royal family very well. Well, over the years, in the same way that Dickie has, and uh, exactly the same way that all of my friends have through uh, ch uh, charitable organisations. Who's your favourite then? Oh, the Queen Mum. I love, I love the Queen. We all love the Queen. Why would we, uh, we, we adore them all? But the Queen Mum's marvellous. Why? Well, I don't know. She's got, <laughs> she's got a marvellous sense of humour. She loves showbiz. She once said to me, uh, "What was the name of that act that used to do the um dum 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 did little 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 lump lump?" And we all said, <laughs> "Wilson, Keppel, and Betty." Terrific. Oh, she's wonderful. But and he, course, he's an, he, he's an extraordinary person because last night on the the Monday night when we went to the reception. Uh, he introduced me to the then Lady Diana, now the Princess of Wales, as the Bissarel Bill Albalsal, which is in that idiotic record I did. And you were, you were at the ball as well. Everybody seems yeah. to be, You went to the ball, didn't we've got, we've got two of the three degrees. We have indeed. <laughs> Where's the other? She's at home getting ready for, to, have, to have twins. Twins? Yes. Twins. Amazing, isn't it? So you went to the ball. You didn't go to the wedding, but no. you went to the ball. Yes. yes. It was beautiful. What was it like? Was it terrific? It was oh, electrifying. I think. The whole air was Tell just me about exciting. Lady Diana. Diana's dress, Lady Diana, she then was, because all we've heard well, oh, is that it was red and it was beautiful. <laughs> no, it wasn't red, actually. It was like a, a very spicy looking pink, you know, it was very bright and it was, it was beautiful. It was absolutely, it was, she was radiant, really. Clementina Bentin, tell me about being in, in St Paul's this morning. Was it an amazing experience? Oh, it was. And I was very lucky because I had the head of the gardening staff, Sandringham, sitting next to me. <laughs> and he had known all, of, all the family and the Princess of Wales family since they were children, you see. And he was pointing everybody out. Because it's the great everyone. difficulty. Yeah. I mean, you didn't know who's who. It was amazing. Everybody I mean, there. state occasions, you saw it on the television, yes. did you? Yes. 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 State it, occasions, yes. tremendous, really. Well, well it's a marvelous show and I do hope that it transfers to the West End. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be a great success. <laughs> Is it the one of the first you haven't starred in? No, well, when I was a, a boy of about 15, I went to a very gloomy one, which was I was part of the Guard of Honour, uh, the Eaton OTC, the Officers Training Corps, in 1936 as the, the Guard of Honour for uh, King George V's funeral. And I saw all the princes go past, and one, of course, was killed in a Sunderland in the RAF when I was in the RAF later, and, and uh, one abdicated, uh, Edward VIII, and then the Duke of York became the king, and, and uh, the Duke of Gloucester, and then I saw all the queens and the last queen mother, the Queen Mary, and I saw it all over the top of my rifle, the arms reversed, praying that I wouldn't drop the thing, looking at all this. And you know, within, within seven years, four of those kings, the monarchs, were refugees in this country, like Bernard of the Netherlands and Queen Wilhelmina and King Harkin and King Peter of Romania. One of them was the hostage of the Germans, uh, King Leopold, and all the rest had been wiped out, oh, and uh, King Peter of Romania as well. And all of them had finished with being monarchs at that time, and 75% of the Guard of Honor were dead. 
So I saw the first state occasion as a boy, which I was a part of it, that was a minute part of this. But this is such a marvellous occasion. And you've grown a bit since then. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm getting a bit like Seacom. I know my wife. Thank you very days. much indeed, <laughs> all of you. Have a good Cheers. day. To their help. To their oh, help. to their help. <clears throat> Well, let me now remind you once again that very shortly we will be going back to Buckingham Palace to see Prince Charles and his bride off on the way to Waterloo Station. We've seen the coach going in. However, the wedding breakfast is still going on and everyone there will have tasted the cake. Well, no, sadly, this isn't it beside me. This is merely a, a cardboard copy. None of us have seen the actual cake and are now never likely to do so. So I'm sure every last crumb will be eaten. Now, uh, we must go over to Tom Fleming. Going over to Tom Fleming at the palace, I think we have some news from there. And here we are back at Buckingham Palace, the scene set for the departure to Waterloo Station. The crowd in front of the palace has been uh, pushed back very gently to make a roadway for the departing carriage. Uh, the Mall has been cleared again as a processional route and Inside the palace and inside the archway you can see the travelling escort that will escort them to Waterloo and members of the household and children of the royal household uh, gather there for the traditional send-off from the inner quadrangle. Through the years they've thrown uh, rose petals and confetti and there'll be a lot of old friends of Prince Charles to see him off because we know that at least two of his uh, nannies were there at St. Paul's this morning, and certainly one was at the wedding breakfast, Babel Anderson, who uh, applied for a job uh, in a nursing paper and was surprised to find herself at Buckingham Paris, and not only being nanny to Prince Charles, but to his uh, brothers as well and to his sister, Princess Anne. So everything uh, very excited here and very expectant as we go down the mall to see the Crowd still very thick all round the Victoria Memorial and right up the Mall to Horse Guards Avenue. And there's uh, a very sort of uh, happy feeling amongst the crowd here, as there has been uh, all day, and a certain uh, something rather secretive about that crowd inside that archway there because I'm sure they're all loading up with ammunition now. A lot of policemen to see that they don't chug anything but confetti. It's absolutely marvellous how this crowd, which uh, you saw like a a veritable sea in front of the railings of Buckingham Palace was pushed back ever so gently by about four horses and a handful of policemen. And here are royal balloons. One wonders if they'll be uh, perhaps holding a string like that when they come out themselves. Or will it be tied to the horses' tails? We'll see, because the Royal Muse is... Uh, well known for its, uh, not practical jokes, but its gestures on these happy occasions. We've already seen the uh, horseshoe in the carriage this morning, on its way back from uh, St Paul's and the posies of flowers. In the forecourt of the palace, of course, the uh, ordinary daily business of the Queen's Guard goes on. The Queen's Guard found today by uh, most suitably, the Welsh Guards, the youngest of the Foot Guards regiments, formed in 1915. And through the forecourt again, we can see the travelling escort of Blues and Royals. And it's uh, rather nice that, in fact, in charge of this uh, travelling escort, uh, will be an officer who is also a close personal friend of uh, Prince Charles. So the... Everybody from the royal household, the royal staff now gathered in the quadrangle. And the two children or grandchildren of all the royal household have been allowed to come here and 
share the excitement of this departure. And usually they rush through that center archway and some, I was talking to somebody quite recently who remembered the Queen Mother's wedding and when they departed from that center archway and she was almost trampled underfoot by the great horses of the household cavalry as they escorted the carriage through. The uh, beautiful police horses waiting outside in front of the uh, palace to uh, escort the royal procession to the station. That station is, of course, Waterloo, the largest station in Great Britain. And uh, there you are on platform 12. There is the train, not the royal train, but uh, a rather special train that will carry them south to the beginning of their holiday at Broadlands. And the engine is called Broadlands. So, this is the train that will depart from platform 12, hopefully at 16.30 hours. A non-stopping express. It uh, consists of a first-class corridor coach, a combined guards van, first, second-class corridor coach, and uh, a unique vehicle. Uh, that's not the unique vehicle, that's the locomotive uh, 73142 called Broadlands. And the engine driver's name is Bill Turner. He's 65 and retires in December of this year. He's been a royal driver for 29 years. And so back from the station to uh, Buckingham Palace, where we are all waiting with uh, great excitement. The luggage, I may say, has actually departed. This is why we're all so excited. It's gone ahead to the left luggage at Waterloo. And uh, we are now waiting for the departure of the Royal Cavalry. Some time ago, the uh, awnings were taken down from the balcony, so we knew that there would be no more balcony appearances. And that was the sign that, in fact, things were going according to schedule, although the wedding breakfast started slightly late. We hear that they've caught up with things now, and, in fact, we're only about 10 minutes late from their expected departure time from the grand entrance. So more members of staff and guests assembling. And it's rather nice to see that there's just as much excitement inside the palace gates as there has been all day through the streets of London. Now you know when we were here before just what the scenes were like all around the Queen Victoria Memorial. You see what, what a wonderful job the Metropolitan Police have done, clearing uh, a roadway which some of us thought was going to be an absolutely impossible task, but the public were marvellous too. They all went into the Royal Parks at lunchtime to have their sandwiches, and uh, now they have uh, returned, and they are all along the Mall the whole way, as I say, to Horse Guards uh, Approach Road, because that is how the procession will go, along the Mall through Horse Guards, Whitehall, Westminster Bridge, to Waterloo. So here we await. Patiently, good humoured. Wondering perhaps if they've gone back inside for the tickets. Uh, but as you can see, a very good natured crowd. And it really is warm now, and a perfect summer's afternoon. I remember seeing uh, the Majesty of the Queen drive away to her honeymoon, and it was a cold November day. She went off with a hot water bottle and a corgi under the traffic light. And not only outside the railings, but at the top of the railings. The crowds looking through and cheering at every move inside. 
I may say there was almost just as great a cheer when they took the awnings away from the, uh, from the balcony. It was rather like the piano being moved at the front. Balloons, flags, red, white and blue hats and a bevy of policemen inside the central gateway. Almost looking as though they wished they could grab a handful of confetti and get in there. There's a, a small boy who is a survivor from the early hours of this day outside Buckingham Palace. And there's always been so much to see. Police, uh, the mounted police and the uh, carriage that went through some little while ago. The semi-state Castilian Lando in which they will drive to Waterloo. So now, they are going to have to go rather quickly to get to Waterloo by 4.30. Admittedly, the streets have been cleared, but uh, perhaps they're going to go at a trot and not a walk, or perhaps a canter and not a trot. through that centre archway again. The side gates closed, as you can see. And all these people that you can just see through the gates in there are all members of the Royal Household and staff, and indeed some of the guests who come down from the wedding breakfast. There they are, small grandchildren, I know the Lord Chamberlain's grandchildren are here amongst that crowd. And there are the Blues and Royals looking at the reflection in the windows of the grand entrance. And crowds now shouting and cheering. And of course, what everybody is dying to know is uh, what is the Princess of Wales going to wear for her going away on her honeymoon after that beautiful dress that she wore this morning, the long train. And there you see the lovely police horses wearing for this occasion the officers' horses wearing these uh, white beards or jowl pieces. And what marvellous patient animals these are. Remember, there are a lot of goodbyes to be said, and uh, don't forget to write and send us a postcard and all that sort of thing. It happens in every family. Have you packed a clean handkerchief? It uh, looks as though from uh, what we can see through the windows of the grand entrance that uh, there are people at least round the carriage there. But of course will be the footman in the state livery and the postillions who will ride the four horses that will pull the land. And not the thing to uh, 
we're out on a warm summer afternoon. These gleaming breastplates, and these uh, burnished helmets, and red plumes. The escort is under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Parker Bowles, who we'll see riding on the right hand side of the Landau. The Prince and now I can say Princess were both guests of Andrew and his wife Camilla in October and November last year at the Wiltshire Home. And this has been a day of friends, close friends, old friends, old school teachers that I'm sure Prince Charles hasn't seen since the day they gave him a hundred lines. And of course, quite a touching moment for Prince Charles this, because when he leaves Buckingham Palace, you'll know that shortly after they come back from their honeymoon, they will move to apartments in Kensington Palace. And of course, their country home will be at High Grove. I said uh, that they were stocking up with ammunition and there you see the boxes of confetti. Great excitement. Princess Anne. Uh, she's probably got to get her own back from last time. And there, Princess of Wales' sister there and they're one of the supporters. Ah. And there's movement inside. The escort moves. And in file, they approach the center archway. And we'll see that disciplined crowd of royal household and staff rush forward as we can see there are the guests waving them up other members of the royal household and they're covered with confetti and with rose petals there they go, the rose petals, thrown by the children with great vigour. And there you can just see that the Princess of Wales is in a small straw tricorn hat. And there she is, looking almost like a coachman herself, trimmed with the pink ostrich feathers, pale coral pink silk dress, short sleeves, the silk organza collar with frill, and a cummerbund waist, which you can just see now, designed by Belleville Sicily. And there, from the back of the carriage, inflated silver hearts, blue and silver. A wonderful sight, catching the sunlight, and each one has Prince of Wales' feathers upon it. And all the family standing in the forecourt, waving them off. Everybody's there. And so, as they drive away along the Mall, Everybody's still standing in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. Standing and waving, Princess Margaret. The whole royal family. And so there they go, off to Waterloo. Really 
can't move. They're still watching as they drive away along the mound. A small travelling escort. <laughs> and a notice, like everybody has to endure, just married. And so along the Mall from Buckingham Palace, between these green trees. The silver hearts floating behind. And there, just to the Right of her Royal Highness, you can now see his horse rides the Tim Fernlander Parker Bowls. And so it's all like any couple leaving home and going off in their honeymoon. Royal family, I may say, is still standing inside the railings of Buckingham Palace, just standing looking at this sight that we are seeing now. Get over for the little bridesmaids. Prince Andrew there. And a sort of sense of what do we do now? They've got. And so round into Horse Guard Avenue. The police escort moves. There's little Ernest Long still there on that, that leading postillion with his long service to this royal family. Round into Horse Guards approach rail. And so under the statue of the Duke of York, along the approach road to the Guards Memorial, and then they will turn left to move across Horse Guards Parade and through the central archway of Horse Guards Building, both looking completely relaxed. The crowds enjoying the shade of the trees in St. James's Park. The old government buildings, the back gardens of Downing Street, and on top of the citadel, that extraordinary lawn there growing on the roof, 
uh, about an acre of lawn which has to be mowed by the parks department. I'm sure nobody but uh, those who fly over the city of London know that that's there. So now in front of the Guards Memorial, the Colonel of the Welsh Guards approaches the archway of Horse Guards building. And to get through this archway, you have to have an ivory pass. But I think being heir to the throne means that you have one without sorrow. And there the Queen's lifeguard has turned out with standard. To do the honours, as the Prince and Princess of Wales pass across horse guards to a royal salute. And through under the Major General's window, where the Princess of Wales herself stood to uh, see the Queen's birthday parade only in June. And here they come now through the central arch of horse guards, lovely old building, on the site of the tilt yard of Whitehall Palace. And the outriders now moving into Whitehall itself, the street of government. And never can a procession like this have come through horse guards. this extraordinary barrage of balloons behind and the coach laden with rose petals and with confetti and so as they depart along Whitehall past the Cenotaph towards Westminster we remember many other occasions that Prince Charles has been in stations with his granny and on many other occasions That's not the longest train that Lady Diana Spencer has pulled. Behind her, but here she drives past the Senator from Whitehall into Parliament Street. And Prince Charles, who may have some of these memories in his head of Euston Station and Waterloo and Victoria and Ballater and Edinburgh Waverley, now in his open carriage, drives with his wife to Waterloo. From Parliament Street into Parliament Square, Sir Winston Churchill watching the scene. And so, round from the Houses of Parliament to Westminster Bridge.
Westminster Bridge, built in 1862, a wide, low bridge, not that from which Wordsworth looked upon that site so far. And there, the Palace of Westminster, and behind, you can just see the Towers of Westminster Abbey. And so, halfway across Westminster Bridge, passing from the city of Westminster to the borough of Lambeth. So here we are, the travelling escort, and the married couple. Now, more than halfway across Westminster Bridge. River Thames fleetingly and the strange and different place of London and there from the hospital from St Thomas's love and congratulations Westminster Bridge and into York Road. And Prince Charles has his brothers to thank for the uh, decoration of the coach. They nipped out evidently and uh, strung all these balloons and inflated hearts behind the carriage and uh, put on the notice saying just married. But that's what supporters are for. So now round behind County Hall. Past a hospital which was under the patronage of Her Majesty and Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales, Princess Alexandra. And so round the back of County Hall. past uh, Leek Street, named after Dr. Leek, who uh, worked in that teaching hospital, and here's the time at Waterloo. Can't blame British Rail today. The train will not depart at 4.30. And so coming very near to Waterloo now, just along York Road and then turning right up the approach road to the station. The largest station in Britain with uh, 4,121 trains moving each day. There they are, hand in hand. There's the work of the brothers. I don't think that anybody in London would doubt that they were just married. Or anybody throughout the world come to that. And so from York Road, up the approach road to Waterloo Station. When it was opened, there were only seven trains a day. And 
for those of you who don't know London so well. It's a station that serves South West England and the holiday resorts and ports along the South Coast. The travelling escort. Slow as to walk. And the carriage pulls up the last incline of the sanded roadway. The balloons look as though they're taking off. And even the Brazilians find it fun. inside Waterloo itself. Considerably modernised in the last five years. Although you wouldn't think so to see this wonderful carriage procession pulled by horses. Which rolls the years away. And the carriage is making its way to platform 12. Here we come to the inevitable red carpet. It hasn't been rushed along from St Paul's, it's a different variety. Putman, open the door. And the General Manager of Southern Regions there and the Area Manager of Waterloo. John Pellet is the General Manager. Trevor Adams, the Area Manager of Waterloo. And so, having met the railway officials, they will walk across the red carpet towards the inspection saloon in which they will travel, DB975025. A kiss for the Lord Chamberlain, lucky man. Thank you very much for today. It's all gone splendidly. Sorry we're late. And they've gone aboard confetti clinging to them in the traditional way. The guard is Bill Sailor Simpson, based at Clapham Junction. He's uh, 64, he's been on the Royal Train Lynx since September 1974, and he will actually wave the train off with a green flag. And there we are, it's Bill Sailor Simpson, waves his flag, perhaps even blows his whistle. And the lines are cleared, it's signalled off, and there we go. Pulled by the engine broadlands as the couple wave goodbye to platform 12 to the officials of the Royal Household who have seen them off. And there, a heraldic gesture from British Rail on the guard's van. Time to make up, perhaps. And uh, the heraldic device. Unfortunately, it's not easy to tie old shoes, tin cans, or kippers to the rear coupling of an electric train. But we can stand on the platform like survivors on the seashore of a long day, waving, throwing a handful of good wishes after them for many years of health and happiness, far beyond the points at Clapham Junction. In some 88 minutes, they should arrive at the destination. Their first-class monthly return tickets take them uh, via Rumsey. Uh, stop over aloud to the eastern Mediterranean 
and as they leave far behind them an exhilarated exhausted London whose royal day began all of nine hours ago and there's the time on Big Ben the signatures on the cathedral marriage register far from meaning it's all over for Prince Charles and his Diana mean that for them as for any newlyweds the adventure is just about to begin may they carry the memories of this remarkable day with them for the rest of their lives to cheer them on their journey into the unknown Well, now, back here at the Nationwide Party, we've been watching that uh, departure with you. A departure as smooth, as well-coordinated, and as colourful as the rest of what's gone on before on this incredible day. What do you think of the outfit? Those little hats Very are all nice. the race. Yes, a sort of racy Robin Hood. I was actually most impressed by the fact that it's so relaxed. I mean, that you've even got the balloons and the just married on the back, which I don't think that's ever happened before, has it? Yeah, no, I'm sure it hasn't. Great informality. Wonderful. Well, now then, uh, I'm sure we all wish them well and uh, a very happy honeymoon, starting, of course, at Broadlands. Uh, actually, Joe Loss has gone one better than that because he's put together a medley of celebration.
Very last. Thank you for that splendid medley. Well, when we went over to watch the preparations for the couple's departure, we were talking about the wedding cake. Uh, we have a model of it here. It was a cutout. It's not a real one because the whole thing has been eaten. But what we do have with us is the team of people who baked the cake. Now, Ken Fraser, it was a well-kept secret, wasn't it? I'm sure it tasted marvellous, but how big was the real one? How much bigger than our model? Well, the big one, or the original one, was uh, five foot six overall. And the time you put that onto a normal table, you're talking about eight foot just a bit above. Well, when you des do you design a cake, is it like a <clears throat> piece of architecture? Oh, yes, you've got to design it properly. It's got to balance in size, it's got to balance in dimensions, and you've got to be very conscious of how you're going to cut it up when you need to use it. Len Motley, what went into it? Well, all the good ingredients of a rich fruit cake. Uh, this recipe actually is a secret recipe of Chief Petty Officer Avery. Uh -huh. But I might like to add that uh, there is one ingredient in this which is very um, unique to the Navy and which the Navy is um, a certain mm. amount of pride Don't tell me rum. Genuine naval traditional rum. Dave Scott, did you all work together? You, you did what? I, I did the actual plaques, but it's, it's, a, it's been a real team effort all right, from across the board. You know, and, uh, so many people have been involved on it. What bit did you do? The plaques on the cake. Okay, each tier okay, right, um, has six plaques on. And I hand painted each plaque. And Dave a uh, Avery, finally, you went round to the palace this morning. What were you doing there? Well, it was up early this morning. We had to go down to the palace and uh, move the cake from the display room into the actual banqueting hall. Do the last so, touches. Oh, the last well, touches. I'm yes. sure you must all feel pretty proud, don't you, at Chatham? Oh, absolutely proud. You know, the first thing the first thing we did was build the victory, and we just finished up by doing the actual wedding cake. You know, more uh, And how how long did you keep working on it? Well, we've been working since Easter. You know, and the last four weeks have been seven days a week. You know, well, terrific. Long time. Thank you very much for coming along to our party. Thank you, Thank Thank you. very you. much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, now back to the entertainment and a song which is really very appropriate to the occasion. It's called simply Love is a Miracle and it's written and performed by Alan Price. Here it is.
Alan Price in fine composing voice. Well, we've had a superb day of pomp and circumstance, but at the end of it, I'm reminded of something that the Archbishop of Canterbury said to us on Nationwide last night. He said, you know, when it is all over, in the end, it is simply a marriage between two people. Well, I wonder whether that was actually achieved today. And with me, I have uh, two reverends who were at the ceremony this afternoon, the Reverend Michael Moxham and uh, the Reverend Fred Seacom. Michael, do you think that that ideal was sustained throughout all the, the flags and the trumpets and the horses and the ceremony? Oh, yes, very much so. At the end of the day, it was a very warm, intimate family service, which we think is what the Queen and the royal family, and more important, the couple themselves, really wanted. Amidst that great assembly, you think it was like that? Do you have the feeling in the cathedral that it was a marriage? It was a very at warm between... service, and it wasn't just the lights. Very nice. Now, tell me, you, you are the sacrist, are you not, yes. of uh, St Paul's Cathedral, and therefore you are, with uh, others, responsible for the organisation, what goes on there. How did things go for you today? Oh, very well indeed. There are always one or two hitches. Uh, Barry Rose told us earlier that when he was conducting the Matthias Anthem, a swing of the left hand and the lamp went. What he didn't know was that I fielded the lamp at the first slip. <laughs> just as it rolled under the speaker's feet as he came out to read the lesson. Yeah. And then during I vow to thee my country, Barry turned round and said, give me the lamp, trade, and I'll put it back, and I'll do the same for you sometime. <laughs> and so it was back in place by the time the couple yeah. came down from the signing of the registry. That was hardly noticeable, and indeed it's one of those occasions where everything went so smoothly, in, like clockwork, really. But yes. to achieve that, do you have lots of people running round out of camera sight and behind pillars, making certain that people are in the right place? Sometimes it's necessary if, if you see something going wrong and a quick nudge or a push has to take place. But that didn't happen this morning. The enormous number of rehearsals meant that everything did run very much according to plan, very smoothly. Well, Fred Seacombe here, uh, the Reverend Fred Seacombe, uh, brother, of course, of Sir Harry. Uh, you're, you are newly placed at the cathedral, are you not? Yes, just about two months ago I was made a prebendary. Very timely arrival. Oh, indeed, the, the dean arranged that, I think. <laughs> I don't remember seeing Sir Harry on the telly today. Did you ever spot him? In the... I didn't, no. I mean, I could spot him quite easily, of course, but I <laughs> didn't. <laughs> he was there? Yes, yes. taking two seats. But you're going, to, you're going to enjoy your stay, are you? Oh, indeed. What part did you play today? Did you just march in the parade? I just came in procession, yeah. sat in my stall, enjoyed the service very much, sang and prayed and went out to the others. Well, as you come in, in fact, Michael, you are leaving, aren't you? Because you're going off to Tewkesbury. Is that yes. a sadness to you? Are you being promoted or what? I suppose it is promotion in a way. I'm being in charge of the parish of Tewkesbury and responsible for the glorious Abbey Church. It's a great wrench to leave St Paul's, but I'm looking forward to my new, jo new job. And what a way to leave. Yes. Well, thank you all very much, and, and your part in the ceremony, the smooth organisation of it, was obviously crucial today. Thank you both very thank much. You. Brother of Sir Harry there, and a seven-stone lighter, he tells me. You know, while we were watching those pictures of the prince and princess starting out on their honeymoon, we were talking about the sort of things we remember best um, about the run-up to the wedding. And I think one of the aspects that's impressed us all, really, is how the princess, well, Lady Diana as she was, faced up to the constant attention of the press, inevitable attention, of course. Even before the engagement was announced, she was constantly subjected to a battery of questions and flash bulbs and television cameras. And although she was surrounded almost everywhere she went, she seemed to manage, except of course perhaps for last Saturday, to keep smiling and uh, not even under great provocation did she lose her temper. Mind you, to uh, keep out of the way of the press, she had to resort to some pretty uncomfortable tactics. James Whitaker of the Daily Star told us about one of them uh, during our Engagement Day programme, you'll remember. I mean, I've seen incidents of her being smuggled out in the back of a Land Rover, it happened at Lambourne not too long ago, where she was lying in the back of the Land Rover, which was filthy. It was mud everywhere, but there were old boots and there was bits of torches and uh, uh, even a tyre there. And she was lying absolutely flat on the floor with a coat pulled over her and she looked like a dead body being got out of it. Well, I must say that when the wedding was announced, I thought back to the 1977 Jubilee year. We had Prince Charles in this very studio, in fact, uh, in London, being questioned by an audience of young people about his Jubilee fundraising on their behalf. And I met him to discuss the programme and the sort of questions the youngsters were likely to ask. And uh, very ruefully, he, uh, I remember he said to me, but you have actually missed out the vital question because they will only ask me one question because it is the only question that anybody ever asks me these days, and that is, 
who are you going to get married to and when are you going to get married? Well, it must come as an enormous relief to him that speculation about that has ended and uh, he can now concentrate on living his life and uh, settling down to his duties as a family life in Gloucestershire with his uh, princess in Highgrove House. Uh, not the grandest house in the area, uh, even a little run down by all accounts, but a lot of potential and I'm sure you'll agree. And what a beautiful part of England. Well, in the past couple of months, I've been literally all over the country and indeed the world following the build-up to the wedding and making a film biography of the Prince of Wales. And of course, many things stand out in all that time, but one incident in particular, uh, I heard about the kind of pressure that the royal family has to put up with constantly and indeed the danger that they're sometimes in. I was told about this incident by George Thomas, who was Secretary of State for Wales at the time of the Prince's investiture in 1969. The day of the investiture was an exciting, to some extent a worrying day. Remember that we had had over 50 bombs gone off in the run-up to the investiture. My own office in Cardiff, the Welsh office, had been blown up by uh, agitators who were opposed to the investiture. Well, I had the very great honour and privilege of riding with Prince Charles in his uh, state coach, which turned out to be Queen Victoria's coach, uh, from the station to the castle. We had only left the station, I suppose, about four minutes as we were making our way towards the town, an enormous explosion. Uh, and Prince Charles said to me, what's that, Mr. Thomas? And I said, Royal salute, Prince Charles. And he looked at me rather quizzically and said, peculiar royal salutes. And I replied, peculiar people up here, sir. <laughs> well, I've got a rather personal memory, if you'll forgive it. In fact, it involves my daughter Sophie, who was in the same class at school as the princess. They were at a school called Riddlesworth Hall together for three years, and I had to do all those things the parent does, like running in the father's race. And it really is a surprise so soon after that, it seems to me at my age, to see that beautiful young lady at the centre of today's events. It was brought back to me watching Nationwide last Friday when we talked to Lady Diana's previous school head teacher at the first school she went to. She was a little girl like any of these. She did all the same things. I used to say, stop fidgeting and don't chatter just like I do to these children. Don't bite your nails and get on with your work. She was full of fun. She had a great sense of humor. That was apparent then. And um, she was conscientious, little girl. Average intelligence. Um, just like any of these children. And Good and bad. Uh, as lots of people have seen, she's very, very keen on children. Was this yes, a talent that you could was, notice then? Yes, it was, because her small brother was in the nursery school, and these children love to go in and help if they can, and she always liked to go in and, and help get them ready in the nursery. You could see there was a great power of good to be channeled there. She was very small when she was here. She's six to eight, you see. But it was, there was a, and there was a power somewhere in her. That you could see. I can remember writing that on one of her reports. The lovely lady. Well, I'm sure you've all got memories of your own. Those were just some of ours that we uh, decided to share with you. Our thanks to you all. We hope everyone here has enjoyed our party. And, uh, you know, we've really, one way and another, I suppose, been with Prince Charles and Lady Diana since early this morning when we saw each of them set out for St Paul's. We've watched them being married and shared the excitement of the crowds lining their route back to Buckingham Palace. And now, finally, we've seen them set off to start their married life together. Well, there's very little else that can possibly be added so uh, to wish the prince and princess all health and happiness we have dame janet baker and the band of the welsh guards to lead us in god bless the prince of wales
and there'll be recorded highlights of this morning's wedding ceremony and the pageantry surrounding it on BBC One tonight, beginning at nine o'clock. This is BBC One. And now Penelope Keith introduces a celebratory programme of music, laughter and excitement, Disney Time Special. Disney. 